I want to encourage you quickly before we read the text with a testimony that we heard this week and excited Kathy and me so much. There's a member of our church that has been dealing with something for a long time and was in God's presence Sunday morning. And by the time Sunday night rolled around, that wonderful child of God was completely free from that which had bothered them for many years. God had healed their bodies completely. And it happened. Come on now. It happened because they were faithful to be in God's house and worship the Lord. I want to prophesy over you by the end of this day, something's going to break over many of your lives. You're worried about something. You've concerned yourself about something. Something's been bothering you. Something has been troubling you. Well, can I prophesy that by the end of the day, because you've been in God's presence this morning, it'll completely be gone and you'll be free. Can you receive that today in Jesus' name? <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to I read to you briefly a text. It is a word from the Apostle Paul to the Church of Philippi that I pray over you all the time. And it's in Philippians 1, for verses 4. Always in every prayer of mine, make a request for you with joy. You know how much Kathy and I are overjoyed to be your pastors. You are not a problem. You're not a pain. You're a joy. Some of you can't believe that about yourselves because you know you are a pain, but I'm prophesying in faith, somebody. Hallelujah. Shout with me. I'm a real joy to be around. Some of you lied, but that's all right. We're here for that too. Amen. <laughs> and he said, with all joy, I'm praying for you, for your fellowship in the gospel, even from the first day to now. Being confident of this very thing, that he, Christ, who has begun a good work in you. Hallelujah. We'll complete it, perform it, and finish it till the day of Jesus Christ. Today is, today is one more Sunday in December. I've been preaching about the gifts that God gives us for Christmas. And one of those gifts is the gift called potential. I'll be dealing with that for you in just a moment. One more time, every hand high in the name of Jesus. Wow. Lord, again, I am unable, I am unequipped, I am absolutely inept. If you don't help me, Lord, it doesn't matter how many sermons I've written, how many words I've preached, today is a new day, and I beg your unction upon me. I pray, God, for the favor of your anointing to rest upon me as a man of God, that people, when they hear the word, will not hear or see me but they will see the power of the Holy Spirit. My words won't be enticing words of man's wisdom, but they will be in power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost. And in the moment when I call people this altar and I lay my hands on them, the word that I have preached will be activated, for it is alive and living. And God, I thank you right now that it's going to make a difference in the lives of your great people. We'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Lighthouse like it's a lighthouse praise. Let's give the Lord the best shout we've given him all day long. Hallelujah. Praise God. Be seated for a moment. I want to tell you as I introduced this word last week, this gift of potential. When you were born, you were born with potential in you. What is potential? Potential is unrealized and undeveloped possibility potential is in you it is a part of your makeup it is a part of your DNA it is something that resides in you it's wrapped up in you none of us have to worry do we have potential or not because the day you were born into this world to the day you leave this world God has given you this priceless awesome gift called potential how we handle potential how we develop it how we say that we're going to get better is up to us now I want to remind every one of you because some of you have been with us a long time and I thank you for that and some of you are fairly new to the Lighthouse family I've been your pastor for a short period of time but I've always understood this about my particular call 
Now, not everybody, not every pastor, every minister feels what I feel strongly like this, but that's, that's them. Here's what I feel. I feel it is my role in your life to do everything that I possibly can to help you get better. Staying the same is never okay. Staying the same is not optional. Why? Because we have a gift in us. God has given us potential, and we need to begin to strive with all of our hearts to become better for Jesus. Could I have a great praise about that? Come on now. God is saying, I put something in you, and it's up to you to begin to press toward that mark, that goal. I want to be, I want I to, me to be, I want you to be, I want this church to be filled with striving for our potential. Will we arrive? Will we always get there? No. But when I leave this world and when Jesus comes to take his bride, I want to be a part of a family that's going for it. Come on, somebody. We are occupying till Jesus comes. We're doing everything we can. We have rolled up our sleeves and we are giving it our all. And listen, when you go to bed tonight, I'd love for you to be able to say, I left nothing out there. I gave it all I had for Jesus Christ today. That is the potential that we all have. Come on, somebody. Well, I was thinking about this word potential this week, and I knew that I would be sharing some thoughts about this. And I sincerely said to the Lord, of all the things in December, of all the gifts that you've given the body of Christ, um, the Christmas gifts that you have given us, the gifts that just have been deposited in our lives. Well, why would I, why would I hear from you to deliver this word on potential? And in my spirit, he gave me another word, and he said, here's why, and the word was setbacks. Mm. Setbacks. Now, we all know what setbacks are. I looked it up in the dictionary, and it's temporary. It's temporary defeat. Come on now. It's just not being where you want to be, but it's only temporary. Come on now. Some of you are walking through a valley, and you finalize the deal. This is how it's going to end. And I come by to announce to you that valley is not your final resting place. It's a temporary setback. Some of you are feeling uh, angst and discouragement and despair. And the devil comes by to say, this is how it's going to be. This is your lot in life. You can do nothing about it. But I want to renounce the lie of the devil. And I want to go on record today that Lighthouse Assembly of God, we've faced setbacks over and over again. you face faced setbacks. And we felt as though we may be defeated, but here we are still standing. Come on, somebody. I thought I heard a praise team talk about this morning that we are still standing. Come on, somebody. You, The devil's taking his best shot at you, but here you are. You've taken a licking, but you've kept on ticking. Hallelujah. Why don't you jump to your feet and tell the devil, here I am. I'm still standing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Woo! I want to tell you that setbacks come in four forms. Number one, some of us get setbacks because it's our own fault. Mm. Sometimes we get setbacks because of SOS. We got stuck on stupid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Such was the case with David. Now, David, I want to tell you all something. Some of you cannot forgive yourselves for your crazy mistakes. But if David, the king... The, the one who is, number one, he is always mentioned in the lineage of Jesus. He is the, Jesus was the root, not of Abraham, the root, not of Jacob, the root, not of Isaac, but he was the root of David. Mm. And Jerusalem is not called the city of Moses. It wasn't called the city of Paul. Jerusalem is the city of David. David, David, David. The word has David as one of its key principal components. Can I preach to you this morning and tell you that the longest book of the Bible was a book written primarily by David. It is a book of psalms, poetries, and songs to the Lord. David, the word says, he, this is not said about anyone else, but it was of David. The book of Acts records 
that he, David, was the man after God's own heart. When Saul was tormented with evil spirits, David was called to come in and play his harp, and those evil spirits left. When Goliath for 40 days cursed God's people and the armies of God, it was a young shepherd boy armed with just a stone and a slingshot. It was David that took out Goliath when all of the men equipped in their armor hid behind rocks and and was afraid. And it was David, the one that wrote and praised God. It was David, the one who was raised up to be the king. He fought and killed many, many hundreds and untold thousands of troops in the name of God to protect the throne of Israel. David, David, David. But then we see Nathan walked in and said, there was a guy that had all the sheep in the world. And uh, he got greedy and took the one man who had one sheep, sheep from him. And David said, well, that would be an awful thing. And Nathan said, but you're that man. Here you had all the women, all the things that life could present. And you saw Bathsheba. She was the wife of one little lowly soldier. And you decided in your greed, in your lust, that you deserved it. And you stepped out in adultery, and then it led to murder, and then it led to lies, it led to the death of your child. And all of these things that you have done, you listen to me, everybody. Give me a wave if you're listening good. There are things that you find yourself in a position of, and you got nobody to blame It wasn't somebody else's doings. You you were responsible for your own undoing. You were the one who made those ill-advised, unchrist-like choices. David was out on the porch, and all the kings were at war, but for for some reason he decided he was going to stay home, and here he was. And he could have, oh, I was just going to preach to this church today. He probably could have been singing, We are standing. On holy ground. Whoa, what is what is that? And I'm sure a thought said, don't look again. She's out there taking a bath. And she doesn't know you're there. And you just need to turn around and just keep singing and praising God. Don't look again. I'm going to preach one day a word called just one look. That's all that took. Just took one look. And now he finds himself in this horrible, dramatic uh, scene and sequences of awful events. Why? Because he fell into the trap of the enemy and he made a choice. Listen to me, everybody. You have choices you make in life. I have choices I make. I'm responsible for my own choices. Sometimes we get set back. How many have ever experienced some temporary defeat and it's because that person in the mirror was kind of dumb. I love when I ask these questions, certain people don't raise their hands. I just love it. I'll give you a chance. How many have ever done something stupid to your own self and you only got yourself to blame? Come on, somebody. Then setbacks occur because it is somebody else's fault. Somebody decided to be a jerk with you. Somebody decided to treat you wrong. Someone just decided for whatever reason, they justified it. Sometimes you're, you're living your life, and all of a sudden, somebody makes a, an enemy of you. You know, Paul said, I was your friend until I told you the truth, and now I've become your enemy. I've known, that, I've known that story many, many times. Oh, Pastor, you're just so wonderful. Pastor, you're just so great. I love you. I love you like a dad until i got to tell them the truth, and all of a sudden, I become their enemy. Uh-huh. And there are people then who turn, and they come against you, and they stab you in the back, and they hurt you, and they ridicule you, and they judge you, and they lie about you, and they try to set your good name uh, on fire and bring slander and, uh, and just upheaval in your life, and they go out of their way to be a pain in your rear end. Come on, you know somebody like that. And they've just decided that hating you would somehow solve their problem. And so you feel temporarily defeated because someone that you care... Listen, strangers don't hurt you. It's always the ones you love the most. It's always the ones you're closest to. This world doesn't disappoint me. 
the church disappoints me because I expect more of the church than I do the common every, everyday uh, sinner. Come on now. And you have been hurt by people you loved. You've been hurt by people you prayed for, prayed with, spent time with, worshiped with, been involved with, and somehow they betrayed you. And now you're walking through a setback. Setbacks happen because your fault, because someone else's fault, and then also setbacks happen thirdly because the devil is in this world. It's the scheme of your enemy to produce a setback. It is the wiles of the devil. It is when the enemy comes in and he brings ambushments and entrapments. Paul wrote it this way, do not under any circumstance let us not be ignorant of Satan's devices. First Peter 5 and 8. The devil is like a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he may devour. So let us be sober. Let us be vigilant. Let us be on guard. There's an enemy out there, and he wants to swallow you up and damn your soul forever. And we need to take the fight very seriously. Some of you walk around like, like the world's a great place to be. Like, man, this world is just so awesome, and I just love this world. We don't, talk, we don't think about heaven. We don't talk about going home. We don't think about this, the world that's prepared for us. We're not laying up treasures in heaven. We're thinking all about this world. It's about the here. It's about the now. But we forget there's a prince and pra- principality of the air. He comes, like a, he comes like an angel in light. He is a wolf in sheep's clothes, and he'll send in his, he'll send in his minions, not not the little goofy yellow ones with blue overalls. He'll send in, and I know that because I'm an awesome papa. He'll send in his imps. He'll send in his demonic forces and powers, and he'll begin to trick you and beguile you and begin to get you in this web of pain and heartbreak and deception, and sometimes you fall prey to that. Sometimes I fall prey to that, and I'm not on guard. Listen to me. Can I preach it good to you today? That is why you get up in the morning, and the first words out of your mouth is Jesus. The first words out of your mouth is, I love you, Lord. The first words, I, I love my beautiful bride, but I'll, and she'll hear me, and I'll hear her. And when our eyes open up, she'll say, Jesus, Jesus. When my eyes open, open up, and, you know, pushing 60, I'm so glad. I'm looking forward to being 60 next year. I think it's awesome because I never dreamed anybody could And this old at the same time, who thought? But when I get up pushing, you know, a certain age, you don't just go to sleep and get up in the morning. You got a few little stops you make in the, in the meantime. Huh. Come on, somebody. And don't laugh because you're going to get there. I mean, about 2 o'clock, you're going to visit a certain room in your house. And again, about 4.35, you're going to visit a certain room in your house. Because that gives us more times to call on Jesus. Hallelujah. Okay, devil, you want me to pee all night? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. He's got somebody. And when you get up, you're going to get in your word, and you're going to stay on fire for the Lord. Listen to me, oh, church, hear me. The way that you backslide is one thoughtless moment at a time. One act of being too busy. One act of being in a hurry. Not taking time to put Jesus first. Getting your eyes off of Jesus. The devil, the devil may not walk into your life with some truckload of cocaine and all of a sudden you're a drug dealer and he may not make you a murderer and he, you may never commit adultery. You may never do the bad things in life, but all he's got to do to win you is to get you to get your eyes off of Jesus. It's called a setback. The fourth reason we have setbacks is because life just happens. We're living in a fallen world. We're living in a very dark environment. And the struggles of this world, Paul talked about, I've been naked, I've been shipwrecked, I've been stoned, I've just spent nights and days in the deep. He said, all these things have come against me. But he went on record and he said, watch this, but none of these things moved me. 
and none of these things swayed me. I was like a tree planted by the water. The devil come at me. The world come at me. People came at me. But I just kept strong in the Lord. Come on, somebody. We've got to be strong. Oh, church, let us be strong in the Lord. Let us determine that whatever happens in life, whatever comes our way, you know, I've walked through things. I've held many of your hands. I've been by your bedside at the hospital. I put my arm around you at the caskets. Kathy and I have cried with you. We've wept with you. We've mourned with you. We've rejoiced with you. We seem to uh, know a little bit of your pain. These two beautiful girls over here, um, Kristen and Amber, got to go on a plane this week, had to go down and bury their grandmother, who is a great saint of God. Although she's in heaven, that hurts a grandkid when you have to say goodbye. Come on now. Um, little bitty Ellis, I will never forget, little bitty Ellis was at our house, and I was here at the church, and Kathy was watching Keila's kids, and a guy come in to um, work on our alarm system, and she overheard, Ellis was about two or three at the time, and she heard Ellis go up to that guy and say, my grandma Rose died. It always hurts. There's nothing fun about that stuff. There's nothing easy about that friends that we have, uh, people that we love. We read in the paper almost weekly, someone's ODing, someone's dying with overdose on drugs. There are car accidents. People are, people are hurt. People are uh, in such brokenness. And, and, and in that, uh, things happen in our lives we do not understand. And the devil says, if God loved you, if God was good, he would never let these things happen. But the reality is there was sin set in motion. And sin is going to rule supreme, only overpowered by one thing, and that is the blood of Jesus. And we have got to remind ourselves that the temporary things, Paul wrote it this way, our light affliction. Are you hearing me preach this morning to you? Our light affliction is but for a moment. It is works for us a far more and eternal exceeding weight of glory while we look not at the things which are seen but we look at the things which are unseen for the things we see are temporary but the things we do not see are eternal we've got to keep our eyes on the prize come on somebody lift up a hand and give the lord worship right now and thank him that he's prepared a place for you don't let your heart be troubled if you believe in god I believe also in me in my father's house are many mansions i go to prepare a place for you and if i go to prepare a place for you i will come again and i'll receive you out of my sight that where I am you may be also come on somebody realize that this world is temporary this world is not your home you're just passing through this thing called dual citizenship yes we are in this world but our citizenship is in heaven and we look for a better country praise God hallelujah so setbacks I said Lord Setbacks, setbacks. We all have setbacks. Many of you today are living in a setback moment. You're in a season of setbacks. And I said, Lord, why am I talking about this? Because every setback comes wrapped in potential. Hmm. The setback has potential attached to it. The potential that you have in this setback, the potential to turn it into the way of life. It can become a permanent lifestyle for you. I know people that had a temporary defeat, but now it's permanent defeat. And I don't want you to be like that. If you're here and you know what it's like to have a temporary defeat, shout amen. But here's the plan. It's just for a moment. You're coming through. God is going to bring you through. It also has the potential when you have a setback to change you, to affect you, to make you better. So you come out on the other side better. I think about Joseph. He, he, he wound up in the prison. He wound up in the pit. He went through a horrible 14-year-old, 14 14-old 14 ordeal. 
years of his life he'll never get back. But it wasn't his fault. It was his brother's fault. But I read over in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 19, he said, what you meant for evil, God turned around for good. And let me tell you something. These setbacks, the devil thinks it's gonna, you're going to make it the worst thing that ever happened to you. But indeed, it's going to be the best thing that ever happened to you. You say, well, I've lost my job, but God's got a better job for you. Well, someone broke up with me. Well, God's got somebody better for you. Oh, come on, somebody. I, I, I lost this, but God's got something better for you. God is in the better business. God is in the increased business. He will never be outdone by life. He'll never be outdone by an opponent. He'll never be outdone by the devil. God always gets the last word. God always wins. Hallelujah. I want to put it to you this way. I've said it before, but every setback is a setup for a comeback. Woo, hallelujah. Every setback is a setup for a comeback. So don't you get mad at that, that setup, that you're that setup, that, that defeat, that that uh, setback that you're walking through. Realize that God is with you and that God is going to bring you through better. I know that I've been through some stuff. When I went through it, I thought I was going to die. I couldn't breathe. It was so dark. It was so heavy. I feel so isolated. Some of you know exactly what I'm describing. Dear God, am I ever going to make it through or am I going to die in this condition? But it was a setback. It was defeat, but it was just temporary defeat. Hallelujah. You have the potential to come out better. Now you look back and you say, well, really, I thank God. I didn't want to go through it. But now that I'm through it, I say, devil, you've taken your best shot. You've done everything you can. And here I am still going hard for Jesus. So I'm just going to laugh at you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So setbacks is important. It's why we must reach our potential. Here's what I said last week. I said, in order for you to reach your potential, you've got to do this. You've got to make the decisions that you are going to do whatever you have, you'll make the best out of it. You'll make the best out of what you have got. I remember having a lady in the church, and I've told this story, but she actually was Steve Tushlog's grandmother, Annabelle Tushlog. And she was a part of the church when we first came, a wonderful, sweet woman. And her husband and her had built a beautiful home. And when he passed, she had a beautiful home. She, and, and Steve's with his mother-in-law right now. What a great guy that is. And uh, so Steve, you can tell him I told this great story. Beautiful home and had china cabinets and some, some nice things in her house. But there was no cash flow for her to live on. She barely etched out a life. And she said to me one day, she said, she said this. She's a pastor. Um, I've got just a few little things. You guys remember Annabelle? I've just got a few. Teresa, right? I just got a few little things, Tim. I just got a few little things and to eat. I don't have, I, and I just really, really down. And I, wanted, I was going to help her, but I said, here's what I think you ought to do. I've told this story, but I want everybody to listen to me. I said, I've been to your home, and I've seen you got beautiful china. I think she says something like she's got a couple hot dogs and a can of beans or something like that. And instead of going home and sitting on the couch with your paper plate, eating that last little dab of food you got, I want you to put out the, the china, I want you to put out the placemat, use real uh, silverware, put, you know, put that little um, uh, thing, napkin ring out, use, get the crystal to, to put your water in, and I want you to go home tonight, set some nice music, light a couple candles, and sit there like you're a king's kid. And here's what setbacks will do for you. It'll bring out the fight in you, or it'll bring out the self-pity in you. And sometimes people just sit around and they just talk about how they don't have this, how somebody has it better than them, how why does this happen, and woe is me. And the devil brings all the bells and whistles to any pity party you'll ever want to throw. So I said to her, I know it's going to be a challenge. I know it's inconvenient. You have to do dishes, and it's going to require a little effort. But tonight, could you just go and do what I've asked you to do? And and I felt like the Holy Spirit was, was telling, here I was, 28 years old, telling this woman how to live her life. She was 50 or 60. But I just felt the Lord say that to me. And she said, I'll do it, Pastor. Oh, yes, I will. So she calls me the next day and says, I've got the greatest breakthrough in my spirit. 
I tell you what, she said, something happened to me. I sat down and I got my silverware out and I, I didn't gulp down my hot dog. I pretended it was a filet mignon. And I just said, God, I want to thank you that I'm a king's kid, that I belong to you. And that I am going to enjoy this meal to your glory. And I'm going to believe that you're going to come through. What she did not know when she called me, that we already had four or five bags of supplies and groceries in the car. And it was en route. <laughs> Hallelujah. But listen, we've got to stop comparing ourselves and feeling bad about our lives and our lot and what we, have, what we do or do not have. If you want to reach your potential, begin right now and make the best of what you've got today. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. I'll never forget. I had this old Chevrolet. And I shine. Something about my cars, I like to keep them clean and shiny. And, you know, I, 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 got, I always drive old cars or whatever. But it was, it was always clean and shiny. And, but I had to put a board in the back seat because I was real heavy and I broke the seat down. And so every time I got in, it was like, well, I was driving like this. So I put a board, I leaned it in that back seat. And, and people talk about, well, look at the past driving this all shiny car. And I thought, you didn't look very good because there's a board holding up that seat, Bubba. Come on now. But I, I, I said, Lord, this is the car I've got right now. And I'm going to take good care of it. Hallelujah. And I, I can't afford to get the seat fixed, but I can find me a board. Yay! you got to make the best of what you've got. If you want to reach your potential, do it toward the glory of the Lord. That brings me to the second reality. When you want to reach your potential, you're going to commit to excellence in everything you do. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says, And whatever you do, do it heartily. Do it with all your might. Don't do it half-hearted, but give it your very, very best. Hallelujah. And God will reward you with an eternal inheritance. We had a uh, quick story. We had a Christian school. The Christian school used our facilities Friday for their Christmas program. And my, my little grandson, Ellis, Dylan Akita's little boy, he's in the first grade. And before the program, he took construction. Boy, I'm emotional today. Wow, hallelujah. He took construction paper, and he made these little handwritten with crayons uh, Christmas cards. And he made 20 of them. And it was in his little heart to when everybody got here, and there was hundreds and hundreds of people in this church, uh, grandmas, grandparents, parents, aunts, uncles. It was in his heart to, to go to the audience and just begin to pass them out to them. He made them all himself. And we didn't know it until we found one uh, afterwards, and he, he said these words. He said, Jesus loves you. Now it's your turn to love him back. And guess who, guess, guess there's a papo nana has kept that. Let me tell you something. We talk about Christmas, Jesus loves me, Jesus gave. Listen, when you go love him back like you know he ought to love, like he deserves to be loved back. When, you, when are we going to stop giving half an effort? When are we going to begin to stop being semi-faithful? When are we going to stop just doing half of a job for the Lord? And if you want to unwrap that potential, that unrealized possibility, and, and believe that God can do great things in your life, it is time that we give Him our all. We commit to excellence in everything we do. When we praise Him, we're going to praise Him with all of our hearts. When we, when we handle our finances, we're going to do it as unto the Lord. He is going to be first. He is going to be Lord. He's going to be King. Nothing is more important than Jesus. Jesus loves you. Now it's your turn to love Him back. Come on, somebody. He did it for the glory of God. This little bitty pup, he, uh, so Ellis was in there. And you know, Papa, I, I, well, aggravating. I'm, I'm just ruined. I'm a ruined Papa. I just, so, so I pulled out several dollars. And I said, Ellis, you did so great. Just for the cards I even knew. And I just put, um, I don't know, five or six dollar bills in his hand. I said, 
this is for doing such a great job. If I can reward my kids for scoring basketball goals, I can reward them for doing something for Jesus. And so, so we went home with his cousins, and I said, uh, did you put your money in your bank? And you know what? We, we do have to do things for the right motives, everybody. Come on. It's not good enough just to do the right thing. You've got to do the right thing for the right motives. We've got to do everything we can for the Lord. And I said, did you put the money in your piggy bank? He said, oh, man. He said, it's in the hamper. He, ch <laughs> he changed clothes, put his pajamas on, and there was Chuck. Go get the money out of the hamper and go put your <laughs> I don't know if he did. But we, we, just, we just desired to serve the Lord with all of our hearts. Church, Lighthouse is not here to just be an average Sunday morning crowd. We've got jobs to do. We've got things to do. And we need to do it with all of our hearts. Could you jump your feet and just make that decision right now in Jesus' name? I'm going to give the Lord my very best. I'm going to give the Lord everything I've got. Hallelujah. Come on now. How many, we should remain standing. I've got a question for you. How many of you know that you can give him more than what you're giving? Come on now, let's be honest. Shoot that hand up high in the air. You can give him more than what you're giving. you got some left over. Come on now. You're not all poured out. There's something left in the tank, and he deserves it all. Love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, all your strength, all, all, all. To reach your potential, I want to give you one more thought here. You've got to decide to make great choices in life. Your choices make or break you. You've got to determine, I will make great decisions. Now, you made a great decision by being here today. And I want to ask all of you, uh, some of you right here, listen to me. You're walking through a season of setback. And um, I love Danny Gokey's song about talking about, here comes the comeback. You, you are ready for a comeback. That's what's going to happen. You're, you're, you, you know, you fell, but you're on your way up. You're on your way up. I'm telling you, my attitude is, I'm not down, but I'm getting up a lot. Honey, come over here for a minute. 38 and a half years of wedded bliss. And we've never had, the reason we're so happy is we've never had the first argument or problem. Everything's always turned out our way, exactly how we planned. I drove by the house that I insisted on having one time. I drove by it this week. A house I, I thought was our home. And I did not know then, but now they have a huge old factory built right in its yard with cars and lights and noise. And if I would have had my way, well, I don't know. She had a vision about the home we lived in now. It was the most wrecked, broke down, beat down, dilapidated house. And we kind of fussed about it. But I did what every good husband does. I said, honey, you're right. I'm wrong. I apologize. Amen. We've had setbacks. This church has had setbacks. We've gone through things we didn't want to go through. But still residing in us is potential. Do you know why on the top of our 2020 vision is a thousand in attendance? Because that is where our potential is. No kidding. That is the church we need to be. That's the church we probably already should be. But we're going to not get discouraged. We're going to head there. And we're going to see it happen because we're not going to quit. Where'd you go? You ain't getting off the hook that easy. Now go back to your seat. Where are you today? You say, Pastor, yeah, I'm having some setbacks in my life. I am. The devil tried to tell me it's how it's going to be. Raise your hand if that's you. Yeah. 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 
I may have did it to myself. Someone else may have did it to me. The devil may have did it to me. Or life did it to me. But I have a setback I'm walking through right now. Maybe I've been set back financially. You heard that phrase? Oh, I had a financial setback. I've had a health setback. Every setback is a setup for a comeback. If you raise your hand, would you come and join me at this altar? No. I, uh, I would preach any word that the Lord ever tells me to if it's for one person. I don't measure the victory in the number of people who respond. I haven't said that. He gave me this word on setbacks today. We have a great group here, but there are some who yet need to be here. And I'll just say this to you. Your response in obedience determines how long this setback is going to continue. If you're not desperate enough to walk to an altar, it'll probably turn into a long, hard winter in your soul.